Folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest in the Sydney Institute's uh, virtual meetings and discussions at a time of pandemic. And today it's with Catherine McGregor, who's well known to many of you. And before I introduce her, just say briefly uh, thanks to those who sent in questions for the Q&A, which will start immediately after the talk. Now, Catherine McGregor, I suppose, these days is uh, best known as a Sky, Sky News contributor. Um, she's a freelancer freelance journalist and occasionally writes for the Australian. And today's topic is Australian society after that pandemic. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I must concede up front, I'm not a specialist in economics. Uh, I, have an, I have a background as an historian, predominantly, and I've worked in the media and politics, and I served for the better part of three decades in the Australian Defence Force. So I'm a generalist rather than a specialist, so I, any caveats that I make about where I think the economy is going or where I think the society broadly are going are just those purely of someone who's been immersed in our political culture and some of our larger debates over a number of decades. And it's on occasion such as this, perhaps getting old uh, becomes something of an advantage in that one of the things I'll try not to do is refer to unprecedented or new normal uh, too often, because I think those two words have emerged from our bushfire season and the pandemic uh, and are being bandied about in an unprecedented manner, which uh, I think is actually uh, shows the ahistoricism of the generation that are most active on social media and elsewhere now, and which is defining a, both a coarsening and a dumbing down of our public culture. And that has been one of the dispiriting trends that I've seen over near three decades of fairly close involvement uh, with Australian politics and public life. The pandemic uh, has been a shock in the sense that uh, bushfires have been part of Australian history for a long time, while the current, the recent season made heavy demands on Australia and did cause considerable damage and consternation. Uh, it seems almost, uh, while it's only uh, six months ago, it seems as though that happened in a more benign, happier past. Uh, I can still recall vividly uh, doing a broadcast of Sky News on New Year's Eve with Chris Smith and coming out into the streets of Canberra, which were deserted and uh, shrouded in smoke with visibility down to mere metres. And I looked back at Parliament House at, uh, in, in the gentle twilight and couldn't even see the Australian flag atop that building. And those who were familiar with Canberra or been on business there would know that says a lot about the visibility and there was a, a sense of gloom and almost uh, like a, a war terrain around the city that night that was incredibly disconcerting and uh, within a couple of days I took a road to trip to Sydney just to get some clean air and I remember thinking that that was about as bad as things could get and uh, very foolishly <laughs> remember thinking uh, in the first weeks of 2020, well, that's all behind us now, let the good times roll again. And here we are now having just passed through the winter solstice of the, the darkest, shortest day of the year. Uh, with the country, I think it's fair to say in something of a state of mental gloom, widespread anxiety about the future, and certainly very challenging uh, economic circumstances. A number of observations about that, and I think that's where I try to forecast, if, and it's fraught with risk, but this seems to me to be essentially a private sector recession. Uh, colleagues at Sky, Alan Jones and Adam Crichton in particular, have constantly made the point that there are large uh, sectors of the economy almost inoculated entirely against the realities of what has happened. Uh, the burden has fallen enormously on the private sector and it has been also amongst the uh, younger casualised labour forces uh, in hospitality, tourism and other areas where that burden has fallen extremely heavily. Uh, I suspect it is also damaging the superannuation savings of many self-funded retirees and again those votes were decisive or of some, some import in the election that Scott Morrison won uh, a mere 13 months ago. And so there are many groups at high risk as we move forward. And I think how Australia responds in the coming years to this is going to define uh, a lot about our politics and about our social structures. 
and I'll say a couple of things that I want to just um, preface this by is that I view many of these trends with alarm. Uh, I've um, I've had you, a benign view is to say I've had an eclectic past in politics. Uh, others who are less um, less well disposed towards me would say I have been treacherous and erratic, and I will live with those. Um, appellations as well because uh, I've done things that I've regretted and on most occasions I've uh, been held publicly to account for those things including falling out with both major political parties at very times but where I've ended up as a 64 year old person living in Australia in 2020 I would define myself as a conservative I'm unabashed about saying that while I don't belong to a specific faith tradition anymore because of the nature of, my, of, the, of the life choices I made and having a gender reassignment, I was raised a Catholic. And I was raised a Catholic during an era in Australia when sectarianism was still quite a factor. I remember my very, very devout mother telling me that I had no chance of entering the Royal Military College because they just didn't take Catholics. Uh, she said they'll give those spots to kids from the, the good grammar schools and so on. And I was delighted to be able to prove her wrong and she was equally delighted that I joined the military forces following a grandfather and a father into the Australian Army. So I've been on something of a journey, to use a, another term that I, I, I bore using to describe life, but um, I started as a fairly conservative young person, raised in a conservative family, I went through uh, a youthful flirtation with the left, but essentially always belonged to the mainstream of the Labor Party, the dominant right faction, which at its zenith, before it became populated entirely by spivs and apparatchiks and bag handlers, was actually a serious counterweight to hard left infiltration of the trade union movement, and it traced its lineage back to the McKells and others who rescued the party from the Lang era. And people uh, such as John Ducker and Graham Richards and Laurie Short and others who fought uh, important battles to keep the Labor Party as a mainstream Australian party with genuine roots in the working class. The coalition uh, for which my parents voted, I suspect when they weren't voting DLP, they voted Country Party. The LNP uh, always was seen as not, not a party of the big end of town where I came from, I came from regional Australia, but it, uh, it evolved into a centre-right party and I comfortably will describe myself now as occupying the centre-right ground. I'm not an economic libertarian, but I'm not an economist either, so my judgments on the economy are impressionistic at best. But the points I make about where I, uh, my fears and my and whatever predictions for what they're worth, and I'm doomed to be in the presence of Jared, who has an elephantine capacity to recall predictions by people, and um, he holds them to account. But I've, I thought as we entered the COVID-19 lockdown and the COVID-19 phase, I wrote a couple of whimsical pieces which I had the pleasure of discussing with Jared and had also discussed with Paul Kelly. And one thing, one hope I expressed was that Australia might come out the other side of the, the crisis with a degree of seriousness and a, a greater degree of social cohesion than we had seen over the past couple of decades. I do genuinely believe that the proliferation of, of, of social media platforms, and I'm, I'm dating myself, uh, I still enjoy reading a paper copy of the newspaper. I'm a creature of another era. Uh, before I closed my Twitter account, I was regularly insulted as a boomer. Apparently, that's one of the new terms of disparagement, uh, as a baby boomer. And I think Twitter and uh, Facebook and other me uh, media have led to a, a coarsening and a dumbing down in our public life. And I, I expressed the view to Paul Kelly that I thought for the first time in some decades, uh, Australians would have to focus on some rather meaningful things that might have a cohering rather than a divisive effect. Uh, they may not take economic growth for granted to the extent that they otherwise would have. And that some of the more esoteric debates that have been part of the culture wars, and a lot of these have emanated amongst uh, the left, especially the academic left, and have uh, been the essentially the, the, the trade 
the work in trade of identity politics, so-called. And again, I, I, I don't like using throwaway lines too readily, but that is a useful catch-all term, which I'm sure most of you will understand. But the rise of identity politics and a lot of the fragmentation that's occurred in our civil discourse, I think, is driven by social media and the proliferation of really poor scholarships on our universities. And as an aside, I'd say that I'm shedding no tears whatsoever uh, to hear the bleeding from the humanities sector, which, in my view, has become uh, has has dumbed down considerably. And there's a proliferation again of degrees that are very expensive, but of very little utility, and authentic scholarship uh, of the type Jeffrey Blaney uh, and others, uh, and, and even people. Uh, whose political views I perhaps don't agree with, even people like uh, the Donald Horns and others, and, and for argument's sake, Guy Rundle on the left, who's at least uh, a serious thinker, whatever one thinks of his politics. Uh, they've been replaced by people who are doing very esoteric stuff in, the, in, in highly segmented areas of gender, racial, and other forms of studies. There is a place for these. I'm not arguing for censorship whatsoever. But the Western canon, uh, it's not being taught with any authority at most institutions. The rel relatively recent experience on campuses of the Ramsey Institute not being able to find a home while Confucius Institutes have proliferated around our nation uh, has been an incredibly dispiriting thing to see. I had the great advantage of uh, being taught by some wonderful professors at the Royal Military College in the 1970s. And I look back on that period with great nostalgia and affection having studied at the feet of a giant of LCF Turner, an expert on the operations of Napoleon and the American Civil War. I later, at Oxford, was um, taught by the Chichely Professor of the History of Warfare, Hugh Strawn, one of the genuinely great scholars of the Great War. I uh, also had the, the pleasure of working with H.R. McMaster, who served in the Trump administration and was a very serious military officer working for General Petraeus in Iraq. And to see the standard of lecturing and reading and the curriculum at Oxford in history, and also at King's College London, where I did some advanced work with Brian Holden Reed, perhaps the best non-American historian of the American Civil War, it became really apparent to me when I returned to Australia just the poverty of our academic institutions and the degradation of our uh, teaching and research in the humanities, and I think we're impoverished by that. Uh, as recently as this morning, Nicholas Whitman made an impassioned plea on behalf of humanities, and I've got respect for Nick, and I, uh, the case he made would have had merit if the humanities were teaching the things that he purports that they teach. They no longer do. Universities are in a, a, a very, very highly respected uh, Chief Justice of Australia, Robert French, found that while, while there was no crisis in free speech on our universities, did find, did identify a real deficit and sought the uh, support of vice chancellors in trying to end the cancel culture and the erosion of free speech on campuses. And again, it's regrettable that that discussion has to be had. Going into lockdown, I thought some of these more esoteric courses might be eroded or blown away by the harsh winds of reality. But in recent weeks, we've seen as regrettable and appalling as the willful killing of uh, George Floyd has been, we've seen a wave of discontent sweeping through uh, Western liberal democracies. That has been alarming. I would not say it is surprising, however, because in light of what I had to say about the academy and about the degradation of political discourse and about the inability of our societies to have civil disagreements at any level of nuance and abstraction, I think the fruits of what we've seen in recent weeks, there was a degree of inevitability about it. But as, uh, as I said, Jared's, uh, Jared's very good at uh, holding profits to um, their uh, predictions and has also a deep sense of history. None of this is unprecedented, but I was alarmed at the speed with which we've seen an unravelling occur in places. Uh, I wasn't entirely surprised at developments in the United States 
I am old enough to remember the long hot summer of 1965 with rioting in Watts. I lived through the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy in 1968. I can remember the Kent State Massacre, so-called, where four people were killed at, um, uh, on a university campus in the anti-Vietnam demonstration after the invasion of Cambodia. Racial issues have always been an undercurrent in the United States. Uh, and again, to give it some perspective, as a Civil War scholar, that was a bloodbath. In a country not much larger than Australia is now, there were 620 odd thousand battle deaths in that war. So before people become hysterical about the level of violence assailing the United States recently, one needs to keep in mind that Lincoln commemorated a cemetery in which were interred thousands of soldiers. Uh, more Americans died in that conflict than in all US wars combined up until about 2013 when the cumulative losses in the 21st century finally added to the Great War and others finally surpassed the battle deaths in the Civil War. Racial violence in 1968 reached a crescendo and Lyndon Johnson as President of the United States was actually in the war room in the White House directing operations to uh, defend the Capitol and other buildings against uh, rioting in the streets. Many US cities uh, ended in flames after the death of King and the Democratic Party Commission in Chicago degenerated into rioting and, and, and mayhem. So it was a turbulent time and nothing that we've seen this year uh, necessarily surpasses it in, in relative terms. But what I find dispiriting about it has been that where there was genuine grievance behind some of that, uh, some of that behavior and it came very much on the heels of uh, the civil rights legislation Lyndon Johnson inherited from John Kennedy and only as a Southern Democrat was able to, to get through the Congress, what has been more alarming about the recent spate of violence has been the sheer nihilistic and civilization denying aspect of it. The, the madness of crowds, I uh, have not read, read yet, but it's a wonderful title for a book by Douglas Murray, and I've enjoyed enormously the contributions I've seen from him in shorter forms and in interviews where he emerges as a, as a serious conservative thinker. And the madness of crowds has been quite terrifying. To think that on the 6th of June, the anniversary of the D-Day landings, when Europe, Western Europe at least, was uh, liberated by a coalition largely led by the United States, to have statues of Winston Churchill defaced by mobs in the United Kingdom was just incredibly dispiriting and gave me real pause to wonder whether the era through which we're passing is not something of a defining moment in terms of the long march through the institutions that has been, been achieved in imparting extremely uh, yes, destructive views of self-loathing about the nature of the West and our liberal democratic project. There's a rich vein of literature which Paul Kelly's highlighted in recent weeks about the crisis in liberalism and that has been a theme amongst uh, thinkers for some time. And there's also been a vibrant discussion in these national security and foreign policy communities about the return of autocracies in that you've seen the return of the, the strong man uh, in Putin. You've seen China becoming increasingly autocratic and increasingly assertive. All of these are worrying trends. And the United States clearly uh, is still afflicted by, by deep systemic fissures over the issue of race. There's no denying that, no, no serious person denies it. But when one sees uh, African-American neighbourhoods being torched and African-American police officers being killed as well, one realises that this has now unravelled in a way that is destructive. And I think really uh, there is a moment now where we really need to pause and, and ponder the future with some degree of trepidation. We are reaping a whirlwind. 
and the fact that so much of the uh, ideology that was imported into Australia to see at the height of this pandemic when businesses were going to the wall, when families were losing loved ones and holding funerals with 10 or fewer, when people couldn't visit nursing homes, to see demonstrations essentially derived from the death of an American citizen proliferating in Australia as though our circumstances were akin to that, I, I found frankly mind-boggling. And But to, to utter that uh, on social media or elsewhere was to invite immediate uh, branding as a bigot or a racist and uh, the lack of historical context about some of the US figures. Uh, I was horrified. Francis Scott Key, who penned the beautiful rhyming couplets, couplets of the Star Spangled Banner statue, was torn down. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer who, under an attempt to enforce the writ of habeas corpus, was on a British ship in the um, harbour at Baltimore when the British blockade of Baltimore was occurring after a British army had sacked Washington DC. Quite extraordinary to think someone would attack a statue of that nature. Locally we've seen strange conflations of James Cook and Arthur Phillip, um, none, no less than a, a yes, Deputy Chief Medical Officer in Victoria wrote a, a silly tweet about James Cook which if a, a, a rugby union player perhaps had said it about uh, some other cause that was more fashionable uh, would have had their contract cancelled, but the Premier and Health Minister both had no problem with it. At the height of the pandemic, a public servant engaging in that kind of conduct. So all these are symptoms, in my view, of, of something that, I don't wish to sound too hyperbolic, but th there are symptoms of a civilization crisis. And I know at the Sydney Institute of all places, with Gerard and Anne, and, and Gerard uh, having known B.A. Santa Maria. Uh, B.A. Santa Maria was writing with some foresight and alarm about these kinds of trends uh, during my lifetime. I vividly remember his program Point of View, uh, which always came on after the World Championship Wrestling on a Sunday in the trauma of my youth, and uh, inevitably we would have uh, a, a baked chicken lunch uh, after watching wrestling in B.A. Santa Maria who would uh, often talk about uh, the institutional decline of the West and about the infiltration of key uh, institutions in the West and now, uh, you know, without putting words in his mouth, he foresaw I think some of these trends on, on our self-loathing about Western civilization and the lack of vocal defenders of, our, of the project that is the West. And I'm concerned about that. Looking beyond the immediate future, the two meta trends that do worry me is, I think, as a person who uh, considers themselves on the centre right, and given now that I'm 64 and in my twilight, uh, I doubt I'll change affiliations again. I've been, as I said, through various circumstances and phases of life. My politics have evolved or changed, some would say contradicted. Um, I fitted broadly into the social democrat paradigm for a while, but I've always been extremely conservative on national security and I defy anyone to find anything on the record where I've not been extremely uh, reliably anti-communist and a skeptic about totalitarianism in any form. And I'm alarmed at the rise of China. I believe they are a revisionist power they have not been idle during this period, despite the fact that I think they are sustaining more damage internally than we are yet to fully realise. They've um, continued to mount pressure on Taiwan. Xi, uh, in the most recent People's Congress, made it very clear that he regarded the situation in Taiwan as untenable and unsustainable out to 2050, which was their original timeline about the wayward province being brought to heel. Uh, there's an element of adventurism in their behaviour, both in coercion of Taiwan and in their conduct towards Japan, and as recently as last week, the incursions around the disputed line of control with India, all worry me enormously about the conduct of China. I've spoken to senior people in the national security community who are very concerned that they will actually try to orchestrate a crisis in the Taiwan Straits around election day in the United States, uh, 
when they might consider the US response could easily be very, very uh, tepid or conflicted uh, during that uh, interregnum or during a period when the United States' focus is not uh, firmly on, on national security matters. There's been an attrition of US power as well. Uh, I've, I've not been uh, an unconditional supporter of Trump. I, I differ with many of my Skype colleagues. That I think the term Trump derangement syndrome is sprinkled far too lightly about people who don't find Trump, Trump's personal style or politics particularly appealing. Uh, to me, I've never found him a particularly, I, I don't think he's a compelling conservative figure. He is a response to some trends in the United States that I think a lot of people, he reflected a genuine anger at political correctness and the erosion of a lot of traditional values and he spoke to a very large constituency of hard-working, disenfranchised people who would have been Democrats probably up until the end of the Johnson administration. But uh, I, his erratic conduct um, doesn't particularly inspire me with confidence. But he did get one thing right in that he always saw the Middle East conflicts dragging on too long and saw them as a source of attrition of US power. And I thought that his poorly executed uh, attempt to get out of Syria and uh, operations in the Middle East was actually a, 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 a prudent strategic move, even though it was executed badly. Um, so I, I am fearful about the stability of the region and the rise of China. There are some signs of real alarm. They have been vastly more coercive and adventurous than I had anticipated. At home, I'm very concerned that the cancel culture and the sort of uh, proliferation of identity politics has actually intensified during the most recent period. And I'll close on this because it has some direct uh, impact in my own life. Um, I, one of the last tweets I sent before I, I withdrew from Twitter was in support of J.K. Rowling. Um, I'm transgendered. I have, to the best of my knowledge, never particularly claimed to be a woman. Uh, I define myself very much the way Carlotta and the women of that era did, in that I found gender dysphoria very uncomfortable. I had a, a reputable diagnosis more than once about that and in the end did what I felt was the only thing that I could do to survive. And I transition genders. I do not purport to be a woman. I don't claim that title. Uh, I live as a woman and I don't think, you know, I'm not, I hope then leaving the door ajar to uh, go to male prisons or to be forced into male restrooms. I don't think we have to be so lacking in nuance or civility that we can't manage that better. But I think it's incredibly offensive to women to even use the term cisgendered about real born women. I've found the insatiable demands of the trans movement quite extraordinary, frankly, uh, in that the progress that has been made in the, in the area of rights and, and acceptance of trans people has been remarkable in my lifetime. It was safe for me to do it, and it wasn't when I was a kid. Uh, I think the grievance culture in the queer community is almost insatiable. And I think one thing that has concerned me is that a lot of Australians, I suspect, uh, were willing to suspend out in the same-sex marriage plebiscite and voted yes, uh, including a, a significant number of people of faith, on the assumption that that was a destination, not a way station. And I think there, is a, there are signs growing now that identity pol politics in Australia is intensifying. Cancel culture, grievance culture, uh, is quite extraordinary, uh, has reached a, a, a fever pitch in lockdown. I would like to think perhaps it is just symptomatic of the fact that it's displaced anxiety and that more people are spending futile time on keyboards abusing one another because of the loss of productive and meaningful social engagement in the real world. But I think there are some genuinely worrying signs. And on this note I'll close. Uh, I said on New Year's Eve in my broadcast with Chris Smith, and I was roundly abused for it, that I thought one of the key battlegrounds in the coming year, and I didn't see this virus coming, but I did think that freedom of religion would be a, a bellwether issue, uh, given both the fact that the, poly, uh, the Prime Minister is an avowed believer, that much of the sneering towards him is led by people who are uh, 
disrespectful about belief and religion per se, and I certainly know from extensively travelling in regional Queensland during the election campaign, I happened to be in a very small hamlet for Anzac Day, spent some time in my old hometown and travelled Western Queensland. The Israel fallout case was on the lips of a lot of the so-called quiet Australians. So I am not convinced at all that a freedom of religion piece of legislation in whatever form it takes uh, will be um, rejected by mainstream Australia as comfortably as the, as the plebiscite was carried with the yes vote. So I think that's one cultural battleground now that is gathering intensity because I think there is every sign that uh, forces on the left have uh, an insatiable demand to, to de-gender society, they're behaving in a way about uh, gender identity and so forth that I, I frankly find bewildering and again that may stamp me as a creature of my age. I, I don't say that to be gratuitously offensive to anyone but I happen to believe in the form in the binary nature of gender and if you're um, uh, transgendered and transition genders then get on with your life and do other things but the entrenchment of so-called multiple genders and so on the retrospective changing to birth certificates and so forth uh, has left me quite bewildered. And I think these are issues that really do have the capacity to cor corrode uh, the really fundamental elements about our social contract, about um, each person's feelings are now more important than defining reality. And a society that allows this to become widespread, in my view, is imperiling its, its cohesion and survival. So I guess Australian society after lockdown, I would love to think uh, my earlier optimism is vindicated, but there have been some alarming signs, I suspect, in recent months that we're framed, the great liberal project upon which we're built is framed, the constitution upon which the nation was founded uh, ha has been honoured in the breach. We've seen all kinds of uh, border closures that were not contemplated by the founders. Uh, we're seeing an expansion of Commonwealth power, which would have horrified many on the centre-right not so long ago, uh, Harry Gibbs and others among them. And it will be interesting to see where our constitution goes after this. And on final note I'd make is the one institution that might come out of this stronger, funnily enough and paradoxically, is I think the monarchy. The Queen uh, has behaved impeccably with great dignity in, in recent times and been a unifying symbol and the character and quality of the leadership of the Republican movement in Australia, which I supported up to the 1999 referendum, I no longer do. The deeper I've become involved in constitutional law, the more hardwired I believe the prerogative of the royal, the royal prerogative has been hardwired into our written constitution, and it's an institution that served as well. I think it'll survive. And on that note, uh, I'm very happy to field some questions. So many thanks to Catherine McGregor and thanks to those who are sending their questions and now we come to our virtual question and discussion period. Thank you. Catherine, thanks for a stimulating talk and as you know we headed at Australian society after the pandemic and you ended up towards the end of your talk talking about civilization in crisis. Now, you and I have got, I learnt, similar backgrounds. Our parents voted for the Democratic Labor Party. I'm 10 years older than you are. Um, and we've had similar views over the years, but we have disagreed. Um, neither of us have had statutes constructed towards us, so no one can pull them down. Yes. <laughs> but these days, what you've said at the Sydney Institute, you would be able to say, I think, at pretty well any university in Australia. I think that's a pretty fair assessment, frankly. And I, yeah, in the interest of protecting the person, I spoke to a law academic last night. I'm, I'm, I, I've been in the university system, so my critique is based on, on recent experience. I taught uh, in a strategic studies department, so-called, in University of Canberra. No one ever failed. I was censured for failing students who literally were illiterate in English and was told, look, they're good kids, they're driving Uber, they're struggling to let them through. So a degradation of standards, which I think is traceable back to the Dawkins reforms, where CAEs pretended to be universities. So I think there's a diminution of standards has happened. Uh, but the, you're, more importantly, the, the point about the, con, the, the conformity 
that is now taking place in that the you know, pe people who pride themselves on being so radical, the Hannah Gadsby's and the Benjamin Laws and others who are, you know, what John Howard once dismissed as cultural, the cultural dietitians of this era, lead these grotesque media pylons for anyone who utters anything they disagree with. And you, you saw it, but tell me, yeah, Bettina Arnold, I disagree with Bettina Arnold on some things. I think she underestimates the gravity of domestic violence in some cases and, could, and can justifiably be seen to be a victim blamer on occasions, but doesn't mean she hasn't got a right to speak at a university, and that's, that's happened. Uh, people who supported the no case were exposed to violence on campuses in uh, it, it as recently as 2017. So there's a culture there, and we saw the Vietnam protest movement when the left were rampant on campuses. These were places where rallies and rolling discussions and teachings were the order of the day. Now they're the stuff of trigger warnings where you're given a you know, potential list of harms that you, you, know, you may hear something that offends some sensibility. But in a sense it's got worse, hasn't it? Because if we go back to in the early days of the Vietnam debate, there were moratoriums where different views were heard. But Indeed. as the debate went on, more and more people got driven off campus. I remember in 1974, the, the number two figure in the South Vietnamese embassy in Australia was driven off out of the Latrobe campus. I helped to look after him when that happened, although I wasn't involved in the invitation that he speak there. I mean, a bit earlier, I recall, at Melbourne University, the Attorney General Ivor Greenwood was driven yes. off the campus. So, yeah. and this happened in Sydney and other places. But it's much worse now, and it's more all embracing, isn't it? Because in the Vietnam days, the issue was Vietnam, but now the issue is what everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is. It, yeah, it, you, wrong pronoun can you can be you can be destroyed commercially uh, over this this increasingly bizarre range of pronouns that people are compelled to use. Um, I, you know, the, the story, the first hand experience was that uh, there is little worthwhile discussion, and I was enrolled in a JD at ANU as recently as six months ago. What's a JD? Juris Doctor degree. Oh, that sorry. became prohibitively expensive, and I've gone back to the old DIP law run through the Law Extension Committee, Australia's oldest law course. And frankly, the online learning environment there's better. There's a, 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 a current barrister teaching it, um, he doesn't mince his words and there are no trigger warnings and so on, it's just a hard-headed realistic course. But I found the, uh, found the culture stultifying and frankly because of the prohibitive fee structure and the proliferation of a business model built on foreign students, whether it was cultural reticence or, or language barriers, there were virtually no students speaking in class or tutorials. They were all on screens working through, the lecturer would speak, there was very little discourse, no stimulation, no no worthwhile chats with peers. I found it a very, very strange environment compared to tutorials even 20 years ago. Well, going back to, to, the, pan, to the pandemic, I mean, you've spoken about a civilization in crisis. To what extent has that been affected by the pandemic? If you look at the start of this year where you started with your talk, we had the bushfires, not the worst bushfires in Australian history, no. but among the worst bushfires in Australian mm -hmm. history. And we had a whole exchange on climate change, not many other views were heard. Then we had the pandemic, and now we've got an acceleration of the um, shutdown culture, the deplatforming culture. So where's the pandemic fit in all this? Has it made it better? Has it made it worse? I think it's made it worse. And I, again, I'm, as I, I tried to qualify, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a qualified psychologist. I'm not a social social psychologist of the type Bernard Salt is, or dem demographer, but it seems to me that you know, the, the wrongful killing of George Floyd as, as reprehensible, no, no one credible is defending that. Uh, no one credible was, um, in fact, a lot, of, a lot of decent conservatives, George Will, Mattis and others, criticised the president for the way he uh, alluded to using the military to get to St John's Church in Washington. So plenty of sensible people are trying to keep nuance here, but the response to that going globally with an intensity and, and the, the barbarianism underlying it, that's what staggered me, in that this wanton destruction 
of historical artifacts. As a train destroyer, it goes against the grain for a start. But the intensity of the emotions on display, you'd, you have to you, you kind of say rationally, well, it didn't come out of nowhere. So there are some underlying fault lines, and on race especially in the US. But the, the fact that it burst into flames right across the Western world made me think that it has been intensified, perhaps, by the, by the pandemic in the sense that because of the, the sheer level of alarm, social scientists are reporting high levels of anxiety amongst people. A lot of people for a period of time were at home with their kids, schooling them at home, trying to manage work, life pressures, not getting out as much. So it strikes me that perhaps there, there was more fertile ground psychologically uh, you know, right across communities. There was a, a despair and an anxiety that might have led to a, a, an outburst of this kind of behaviour. But it, 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 did, it, it caught me by surprise when it went into a second week and when it then migrated to England. And to see it happening here was on the scale that it was happening here and with the with the accusations being made about substantial figures in Australian history, it just struck me that we'd collectively lost our minds, frankly. So is this because of the fact, I mean, you were talking about, obviously, people, many people in, in uh, the, one, the nations we understand best, say the OECD nation, mm. nations, many of them were physically constrained, and mm. when people got out, there was bent up frustration and extent. So, mm. so, th so there's that attitude, but... What, uh, so you were also talking about this other attitude of, um, of uh, stress. Now, if you go back 100 years, and I wasn't around then, believe it or not, and, uh, but if you go back 100 years, it strikes me, look, as a historian looking back, there was a different attitude Absolutely. to death. We lost... Resilience? We lost 5,000 dead, uh, we think... I'm sorry, 15,000 dead, we think, in the... what well, it came to Australia, the Spanish flu came to Australia in 1919, in a population of five million, so that would be seventy-five thousand dead today, in today's figures. So we have a bit over a hundred dead on today's figures. And the question is about the attitude to death. I guess that those are living a hundred years ago had a different attitude to death because it was more common. Uh, these days, it's not so common. Yeah. So are these is the, these other factors building in that 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 weren't around previously? Yeah, and that, I think that does connect to something I had the pleasure of chatting to John Anderson about this, that I think, that, let, let's talk specifically about the first part of your question. A hundred years ago, coming out of that great war, most families, they, well not most, there was a high incidence of infant mortality. So you may have had a sibling who didn't survive birth or died very young. Uh, the people who went away to Gallipoli and the first AIF on the Western Front, uh, sometimes too, you know, I looked through the High Court bench that, part of that made some pretty tough decisions during the Great War. I think Justice O'Connor lost two sons on the Western Front, uh, one of the founding justices of the court, or certainly in the first... Higgins, Higgins lost his son. And Higgins lost his son, and Justice Kiefel wrote recently about that. I think nearly every one of the justices, bar Isaacs, lost a, a son in the war. I think two things. There was a, a there was more widespread religious adherence. So people people accepted death as a fact of life. This narcissistic cult of the individual, which now is really on steroids, about individual empowerment and the absolute triumph of let, let's call it narcissism. Um, it's about the sensual. It's about the ephemeral. It's about the transient. Whereas religion is about eternal things. Whether you believe it or not, at least it makes it, that is its claim, that, there is, you know, that suffering is not meaningless and that life, however nasty, brutal and short, may have an, an innate meaning and then there may be eternity. And that's, uh, that's a big belief I'm, I'm not uncomfortable proclaiming and I think the piece you liked in the Australian, I, I decided in the current zeitgeist I was going to say it because I'm sick of apologising for it and, or hiding it. And I wrote that I'm firmly a believer. I've written it more than once, in fact. And again, that arouses chuckles from many in traditional faith things, saying, well, your whole life's an insult to God. I'll live with God's judgment on that and, and leave the rest to, to, to God. But I do believe, and I do think, that it, if you have that prism, and it's a shrinking prism in our society now, it affects your attitude to eternal things. 
uh, morbidity, mortality, adversity. And this is where I do think we've lost resilience as a society, not solely because of religion. I see our soldiers in operations relatively recently. We're still breeding tough enough people and running a training system that still does that. But if you go back 100 years, people, people didn't think they were here to live forever. No one had that factored in. There's almost an assumption societally now something has gone wrong if you die or if you suffer adversity. I think it was... I think it was the ABC, but it could have been anyone else. I noticed there was a news bulletin about a week ago, two weeks ago probably, which reported that a 95-year-old person had died in a nursing home. And you think that's on the main news mm. any other time. Yeah. It wouldn't have been. But go back to the, um, however tragic that death was, no, that death wouldn't have been sure. reported. So what you're, what you're saying is that if you believe in an afterlife, you're less stressed about this life. Well, that's the comfort I draw, and at times when, and, you know, the trigger warning, I, yeah, I've been at the brink a couple of times of, of, of ending my life, certainly with the gender dysphoria when I was still struggling with trying to not act upon it, uh, very, very close to the edge, and more than once since. Uh, I found out incidentally at one point that I'd been wrongly medicated. Uh, They'd given me the wrong hormonal dose altogether, and there was a reason that I was in the depth of the depression that I was in. But I have clung ever since I stopped drinking to a belief, to a belief in, a, in a deity. And I went back to the Catholic Church. Indeed, I was a daily communicant in the Catholic Church before transition. Uh, unlike a lot in the queer community, I don't expect the Catholic Church to turn its teachings up inside out to accommodate me. I'm at odds with them. I do not... I, I accept the encyclical that says male and female he made them. Therefore, I go elsewhere to find my solace. But I don't expect to cancel their teachings. So having a, a view that life is not futile, having a belief in a God, a benevolent God, has sustained me through some dark time. I pray daily, I don't say that to be a Pharisee, I just say that, uh, incidentally, that shows you where the cancel culture got to. I referred to someone as a Pharisee online and was told I was an anti-Semite. Um, <laughs> and I mean that, I say that with yeah. a straight face. A, yeah. An academic said it was anti-Semitic to say that. Um, and I, 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 I've not openly espoused a lot of my beliefs, but I, I do draw great comfort from the fact that I, I believe in a God, I believe in God, I, I'm a Christian, I believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and I broadly believe he suffered, died, buried and rose, that's what I, I, I draw comfort from. You're a resurrection kind of person. I do. There are not I, many I, resurrection people around in the Christian churches these days. Well, apparently there are Anglican bishops, maybe, I, I might be defamed, I think the current Archbishop of Canterbury, certainly one of his predecessors wasn't entirely convinced you had to believe it. Yeah. Um, the whole claim of Christianity falls apart at the seams if, if that isn't accepted. And let me, there's one thing that I think is an ascertainable, verifiable historical fact, whether you accept the resurrection or not. The cluster of people who claim to have met Jesus after his resurrection all went to their own martyrdom, refusing to renounce that view. That's potent evidence, even to the most hedonistic 21st century. And going back to the divisions you were talking about in your speech about the pandemic, where you spoke essentially about the division between the private sector, which generally has got difficulties, and the public sector, which has no difficulties at all pretty well. Um, now, moving that comment on that briefly, but then going across. It seemed to me that in Australian society, multicultural Australian society, in the area of religion you're talking about, if you're talking about traditional Anglo-Celtic yes. Australians, there's very little belief. But then if you go into those who've come from Asia, those who've come from the Middle East, those who've come from Africa, some who've come from Eastern Europe, yes. there's quite a degree of belief. I mean, some of it's Muslim belief, some Indeed. of it's Christian traditional some of it's Christian Orthodox, some Correct. of it's um, Buddhist, Hindu, and whatever. So Indeed. we now sort of have believers dividing Absolutely. Um, between the immigrants from outside of Anglo-Celtic nations and those of us of Anglo-Celtic background. 
So is this going to have an impact on... Well, it, it already has, I think, Jerry. If you look back, it, it's interesting that some of the Labor reformists, like uh, Chris Bowen, and uh, I think uh, Tony Burke might be another, I, I need to refresh my memory on the electorates, but there were very high no votes in some of those safe Labor seats, which are also very multicultural seats. And Labor, I think, had complacently thought it had a lock on the multicultural vote. But when a question of faith and belief and, and sexuality and gender came up, a lot of those communities didn't make a large noise about it, but very silently went and cast their ballots for conservative candidates because, and they voted no on the plebiscite overwhelmingly. I think Bowen's constituency was something like a 79% no vote, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, likewise, through that area where Get Up did Peter Dutton and George Christensen and others favours by campaigning against them and being visibly out there, there's a relatively strong corridor of church attendance through key parts of South East Queensland, including my old hometown, Toowoomba. So there is a fault line around that. And I might, might just add, I had, I had a very dispiriting experience with Cricket Australia over this, um, where I, I walked out of the Human Rights Commission consultation process on trans inclusion in sport, and also out of the Cricket Australia uh, consultation process because I, you know, I defined transsexuality in precisely the manner I did in my remarks and said, I, I don't demand to be treated as a woman. I played women's cricket for a while at the invitation of Greg Chapel and Pat Howard. They wanted to see how I went. I didn't reflect deeply on it at the time. No objections were raised. But launching a policy with fanfare the way they did with the AHRC and so on. I recused myself from it and publicly denounced it, which some have accused me of being a hypocrite about, but I, I think my position was consistent all along. I always sought the permission of the coaches and, and, and the players I would play with. And I made this point to Cricket Australia. I said, you're saying this is a game for everyone. Does that include Muslim families in Western Sydney, Pakistani, uh, diaspora communities, Indian diaspora communities, many of whom are observant in their faith traditions. And in grade female cricket, you can encounter players 14, 16, 17. You're opening the door, and this was the draft policy. They ultimately did impose some medical test. But it, I, I was criticised for wanting to medically gatekeep the process and challenged by a queer activist. And I said, you're actually saying that it is totally self-definition. A person doesn't even require a female driver's license to play female cricket. Let me know how that goes in Western Sydney amongst observant Muslim mothers when they realise their teenage daughters are playing cricket with someone who, for all intents and purposes, is anatomically male and not even attempting to conform to social transition. Anyway, they, they didn't implement the most extreme version of it. But the fact that it was even discussed, I walked out on it after that. And yeah. um, in the pandemic, it's because most of the, I think it's fair to say that many of the believers of whatever background are probably more likely to be in the private sector than in the public sector. Mm. They're going to cop more, but they seem to probably be less stressed. Mm. They're going to probably cop more economic problems, but they're probably less stressed than the those or elsewhere, hmm. seem to be those who are making the most noise at the moment are those who, in the social on social media and the social sphere, are those who are less concerned with their, uh, who have no little concern about the afterlife. Hmm. Um, we've got a question here about, I mean, as you know, this this question about where Australia will be in an economic and social sense hmm. after after the pandemic. Uh, so the question here is. After the end of COVID-19, will Australians emerge more conscious of the local strength and economic potential of this nation and less dependent on what is called by our uh, questioner global consumerism? And do you think we're actually going to be more Australia-focused or do you think we're going to miss what we're currently missing, which is um, having less global involvement than otherwise would be the case in terms of travel and contacts. Look, if I had to take a guess, Jared, and it is a guess, I, I think we are entering a, 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 a there's a sort of a re-Westphalian 
emergence here, I think. You've seen the US, whatever you make of Trump, has, has, there's no, I think, I don't think you're engaging in Trump derangement syndrome to say his slogan's America first, he's something of an isolationist, he's wary of foreign entanglements. Uh, Russia has become increasingly assertive and nationalistic, China I've already discussed. So I think you're going to see great power rivalry and alliance systems much more than, I think, you know, the people, that sit on, this is hardly an original thought, the Davos gang, I think, are absolutely going to be the losers out of this. I think you're going to see even uh, fairly liberal liberals saying we need more supply chain security. Jim Mullen's not a classic neoliberal of the, say, IPA variety, neither is Andrew Hastie. They're very much saying we need to be mindful about stockpiling vital supplies, fuel, and so on. So the traditional, uh, even that they would be to the left of Paul Keating on the economy coming out of this, I suspect, for national security reasons rather than economic arguments. So I suspect there may be some demands in that regard. But come, and the other, Adam, Adam Crichton, I think, has been superb in, in his coverage of this. The one thing that I think I'm worried about societally, as a, and I say this as a conservative, is that, that gr the great ballast of the Menzian tradition, um, Scott Morrison refers to quiet Australians and you know, Menzies, you know, defining forgotten people speech. Will we come out of this with a frugal, employed middle class who are capable of saving, putting something aside, owning homes, you know, going to work, taking a punt on a small business or tradies, people of that ilk, people on the land? They are the casualties both of the drought and also the pandemic thus far. And I've had this discussion again with Paul Kelly and Chris Mitchell like a, a couple of years ago. It's one thing I was pressing about. I said, I'm really concerned that the, the problem with importing too much Trump into the centre-right tradition is we risk extinguishment of that great middle, uh, unaligned middle class that essentially aren't noisy about politics. They're not radical. Now, if we have essentially an underclass and those who've survived this, what does the future of centre-right politics look like if you don't have those people Menzies talked about? But, you know, the much, much you know, they're sneered at as the nation of shopkeepers. I think it was, I think it was Hitler said that, was it? Or, or Bismarck said it. Bismarck it said it about the British leadership of the First World War, yeah. Indeed. And you've got, I think there's a tendency on the left to, among creatives and others to sneer at those who engage in the trades and the and the and, and the main you know, run run small entrepreneurial operations. There's been a, a view that you know they're um, you know they're philistines and they're not arty enough and they're not, uh, but they're the great ballast upon which our middle class rests. And then and by extension, they're, they're the centre ground that have supported the centre right tradition, and because of compulsory voting, have essentially seen. As you know, Labor governments are aberrant in Australia. This is the thing that, despite all the cultural noise and the proliferation of people on the insider's couch and Twitter, yeah. Australians misbehave routinely and elect LNP governments. Yes. Yes, if people followed what the ABC said, we would have had <laughs> green left governments for, for decades. Look, we're going to get to the end. I, just, I think it actually was the Kaiser who made that point about Trump. I think you're right, yeah. The Kaiser, about, yeah. yeah so, uh, it didn't end up too well either. So, uh, um, so finally, just going back to your point, because um, you've been close to both the major parties. Yeah. As you point out, you've fallen out with both the major parties. So, and it's far. I mean, two years out from the election, it's yeah. the current. In any climate, is bad. In the current climate, it's impossible. But how do you see, well, the, the leadership of essentially Scott Morrison, Josh Frydenberg, Matthias Cormann, mm. as against the leadership of Anthony Albanese? Uh, and, and his uh, key figures. Yeah. Uh, how do you, s you think it's too early to make that judgment? Pro probably is, but I, look, in terms of in terms of just the talent pool, when I look across the coalition bench, and Matthias Cormann, I think, is underrated. Uh, I think Christian Porter is a very substantial individual, a bright fellow, and a, and, a, and very hardworking leader of the government in the house. Um, Frydenberg, I think, again, is a talent. I think the PM has been underrated. I think I think the, the holiday during the bushfires was a very bad failure of judgment, but he's put that behind him. Let, let's see what happens in Edith Monero. It would be extraordinary for the government to win a seat 
at a by-election. That's peculiarly difficult turf for him, given that the bushfires impacted there, and he did have a very prickly reception, as you recall, at Cabargo and a couple of places when he visited. The local mayor, McBain, is a popular Labor candidate, although, again, she's, she's, she's one of those local kind of real candidates rather than a party apparatchik, so she's not going to be necessarily badged, particularly Labor. I've looked at a lot of the social media stuff, and sure, the ALP logo's on it and so on, but she win, she'll win as a local hero candidate if she does. It would be extremely damaging to Albanese uh, to, loot, to drop that seat, uh, although Mike Kelly, as you know, Mike was a strong supporter of the State of Israel, which is rare amongst Labor people these days, and fairly conservative on national security, uh, fairly conservative candidate. So let's see how that goes. But I, I look across, and, and, and everyone's saying plague on both houses over this branch stacking in Victoria and so on. But the fact is, if you look at Scott Morrison's government, there are fewer professional apparatchiks than there are in the key positions in the Labor ranks. Uh, Morrison may be penalised when, you know, when the teeth dries up, which it's going to imminently. Some people are going to be in real social distress. Could be a very tough time to be an incumbent at the next poll. But on talent, if, if you're looking along the two front benches, who would I prefer to trust with reining in an enormous amount, you know, eye-watering amount of debt and maintaining some kind of sense of liberty and, and, and traditional values, I'd go with the Morrison government, but I've worn my heart on my sleeve in terms of my affiliations already. So we've ended up where we started, which is a good place to end up. In a sense, the impact of the pandemic, pandemic you think, will still be with us at the next election in around two years' time. So that's an astute observation. Many thanks for giving it that and all your other observations today. It's a well pleasure done. to join you, Jared. Okay. Wonderful to see you again.